Hey guys, welcome to the shop. Nothing, nothing is more exciting than new piece of equipment day, and that's what I've got to share with you. A new piece of equipment in the shop that I'm sure a lot of you didn't even know existed. In fact, when I seen it, my mind was just boggled on how to run this thing. So I can't wait to share this with you. Uh, it's a pretty neat piece of equipment, and I've also got lots of new tooling and stuff that I want to share with you as well, thanks to my good buddy Al, the auction hound. So let me share with you some of the smalls, and then we'll move on to the crown jewel, which is the new piece of equipment in the shop. So let me show you on the bench what I'm working on. You'll be excited. So check this thing out. Pretty neat. Does anybody know what that is? I'll give you two seconds. It's a wheel balancing stand for your grinding wheels. Now this, it's so simple, this thing is. It's silly, it's so simple. And you can build one of these yourself. They do sell them commercially. This is a name brand. It's a Sopco unit. Very good, $600, because that's what they cost new. But you can pick these things up used or at auctions for a really relatively reasonable price. So check this out. I've got several wheels that I got to balance and I want to share it with you quickly how I do that because I think that it's pretty interesting and maybe not uh, as straightforward as some people would think or maybe it is more straightforward than some people would think I don't know so this balancing stand is just shockingly simple it really is three feet one in the front to get this thing level front to back because that's all that matters side to side does, doesn't care and the only thing precision about this stand is that these two rods are on the same plane it's just two pieces shafted shafting bolted to this cast iron base. You could literally make this out of a weldment. These rods aren't even recessed into a radius. It's shockingly simple. So it'd be a good weekend project for somebody with either a shop or access to one. And then make yourself an arbor. This is a shop made arbor. So if you buy this new, it comes with an arbor. But, you know, if you get it used, you just get what you get. And that was the case here which luckily I already have one. So let's load a wheel up onto this arbor and let the balancing commence. So I've already checked this wheel. This is the heaviest spot. Obviously it's mounted to the hub and I took it and I dressed this wheel. That way the ID and the OD are concentric because once when they're new, they're not always right on the money or even good and square. And just because you've dressed one doesn't mean that it's balanced. Because the way that these are made, you could have more grit on one side of the wheel than the other, causing them to be unbalanced. And that balance point will always change. The more you dress this wheel down, you're always going to have to, ever so often, if you want things to run as good as possible, take them off the grinder and check them. But you can see my marked spot there. Just pendulum them at the bottom, pendulum them, swinging to the bottom. So now let's take this grinding wheel over to the drill press. Yes, the drill press. And see if we can't get this thing a little better balanced than what it is currently. So in the drill press, I have a mason bit, just a carbide pointed bit made to drill into concrete. Those work really well. And all I'm gonna do is remove a little bit of material at a time, going back and forth between the drill press and the balancing stand, checking my progress as I go. This is not going to hurt this wheel, as long as we're not drilling all the way through it or removing too much material from one in particular spot, it won't hurt a thing. So. Removed a little bit of material. I'm gonna check, see how, how well that done. And then back and forth until I get enough material removed on the heavy spot of this wheel. I'm not gonna drill in the same spot. I'm gonna kind of move around until it rests on that balancing stand pretty much anywhere I put it. Still got a ways to go, but you get the idea. We're gonna go back and forth until this doesn't swing like that. So if you don't want your bench grinders to do the bait scoot and buggy all the way across the shop floor, balancing their wheels is perfectly possible and acceptable in the same manner as this uh, also. They normally just take a straight shaft, you just find one that fits the hole really good 
do the same thing and you'd be surprised how smooth even a cheap bench grinder will run if you balance the wheels. Finally. Now I'm not after perfect here because like I mentioned, as you dress this wheel, it'll change a bit. I just want to be able to pretty much set this thing wherever I want and the friction of just the stand itself will keep that wheel located. And I consider that balanced good enough. Let me show you all that I had to remove from this wheel to get it balanced. It was quite a bit out. Some wheels require a lot of balancing, some require very little. This one required quite a bit. You can see all those spots there, none of which are very deep, and they're spread out. So it shouldn't hurt this wheel at all. Now it should run nice and smooth. So here's a diamond wheel, and I pretty much do those the same way, except for I use a regular bit instead of a instead of a mason bit because it has an aluminum body and I just wait find the spot it's all the exact same process but these pretty much once you get them balanced as long as you don't take them off the hub they'll pretty much stay balanced because you don't dress them in the sense that you dress you don't remove near the material when you dress one of these as you do your standard wheel so pretty much a one-time gig on these things unless you pull them from the hub and then still they're pretty close usually if you've got quality hubs so I'm sure that the majority of you have seen me use this do-all bandsaw. In fact, it's one of my favorite, most favorite pieces of equipment in the shop. Most projects start at the bandsaw, and if you have one that works good or, or that you really like, they're kind of a pleasure to use. This one in particular is because of the hydraulic table and its large capacity. You can pretty much throw anything up on this table and cut it in half. Now, this being a do-all, they offered a ton of different features for it, add-ons, just like you would a pickup truck. You know, do you want the Wi-Fi stereo and I don't know, you know, features, power windows, power locks, cruise, tilt, AC, which are all common on every vehicle these days. But I don't know, what's a feature? 12 foot touch screen? I'm not for sure. But you could get a lot of stuff for these saws and I've always kept my eyes open for the add-ons that they offered for the saw. They're kind of hard to find because they always ended up in cabinets or you know, stored in a drawer at some shop and then the saw got sold and all the other stuff just went to the scrapyard because nobody knew what it was. But recently I've acquired a few pieces of kit for this saw that I think that you will find interesting. I know that I do. And a couple of these items you can, you can build for basically any saw. One of them that I'm gonna show you the first one, which I think is absolutely awesome, is pretty specific to this saw. It could be used with others, but it's pretty specific to this saw. Let me share with you the pieces that I got here. I think that you will find them interesting. I know that I do. Cora, I'm trying to film over here. So when I say that Duval offered a bunch of different things for their saws, I'm not lying. Some of them actually border on the line of being a gimmick other than or rather than being really useful but the majority of them did do what they advertised but did they get used a lot for their intended purpose i don't know i kind of doubt it let me show you one that i think is kind of gimmicky but yet to me is the coolest coolest one of them all simply because of what it does and that my friend is an etching pen made to write on steel parts. This is designed to be used with this saw to mark your parts after you get done cutting them. How does it work? I'm not exactly for sure, but it uses electricity, hooks to the blade welder, and this copper piece, it's covered with cork, you write on your parts with it. Let me show you. I'll show you how this thing hooks up. This one's a little worse for wear, and as you would expect, you know, it, it's old, but that doesn't mean it's not cool. So let me show you how it hooks up and we'll use it. And then I'll show you some of the other neat things that I got for the saw. Ow, I hit my side right on the pelvis. So from the factory, this saw was equipped with a blade welder. And what you do is you take this end of the etching pen and you clamp it in the non-movable jaw 
of the blade welder, just like that. And that gives you an electrical connection to your etching pen. And then it's got a little fold-up, I don't know, lever here that holds in the annealing button or etching button, which is labeled on there. Hold your part on the table, and that grounds it, and then you use the etching pen. It's like a pencil, and it writes on your parts. So let me bring in closer, and I'll show you this thing in action. Can you see that? So I'm just going to write my name on here. And there we go. Well, well, that shows up, but that is permanently etched. My name, permanently etched on this part. I don't even know how well you can see that. But it's, it's a relatively light etch. But I assure you, it's on there. So here's one of those items that I think is really neat. I've never tried one in practice, but the idea is sound anyway. And that is a work pusher for a bandsaw. Any saw with a table, you could probably use one of these. So we've got a lug, threaded lug here, and a long piece of Acme thread with a handle. This lug slides down into the table, a hole in the table. And then if you've got a work piece here, this end is pointed. You can either push against a push block or one of the push V's that uh, were offered with these saws, or you could just push your work itself right into the blade. So you don't destroy your thumbs. You know what I'm talking about. If you've ever used a bandsaw for 15 minutes, you know it will destroy your hands or remove your fingers, one or the other, neither of which are good. And the do-all version, which I think is pretty neat, has a quick release nut. So you can just, it's like, it's a half nuts, what it is. Very simple design. Got a couple little ball detents, a little screw to keep this thing from plopping all the way out. The top part's threaded, and all it does is lock down on the nut itself. It just keeps you from having to crank this thing back. You know, once you've pushed your part in, instead of going, You do stew like this, pull it up and just move it. So that, I think, is a pretty neat little piece. And you know, I was pleasantly surprised to find this thing. So there you go, a work pusher. Make one for yourself. That is pretty effective. It takes almost zero effort to push that through that blade that's pretty dull, you know, standing up or laying down. Actually a useful thing, especially if you didn't have a lot of strength in your hands, something like that could you know, be the difference between you working and not. And very, very neat. So here's a couple parts that I wasn't gonna show simply because I don't know that it'll translate all that well onto video, but I'm gonna try to explain it. Now, Right now, this is a 36 inch saw. I can cut square. I can cut a piece that's 36 inches long and get a nice square cut on it. Well, do all found a way around uh, that limiting factor of the depth of the throat of the saw and they offered blade guides that had a offset angle on them that hold the blade at this angle. So you could take a long part and thread it through the saw at an angle much longer than what the saw could cut originally and still get a nice square cut on it. You know, you could probably adapt this idea to any saw if you change the angle of your guides, but this is an original set of do-all guides, the angled do-all guides. I'd read about them in books, never seen them in, in, in real life up until now. Kind of like hen's teeth, I guess. So pretty neat to get around the limiting factor of a saw, which is its throat depth, simply by angling the blade and threading your part through the body and then cutting. Pretty cool, do all, pretty cool. Here, let go of it so I can see it.
So here's a really neat bandsaw attachment that's probably a little better in theory than it is in practice, and that is a circle cutting attachment that attaches to the upright. I've got a lot of stuff attached to mine, so it's not gonna be down there where it really should be, but it attaches pretty quickly, actually. Quick attach to the upright, and then you can slide this in and out to change the radius of the circle that you wanna cut. It's got a little indicating or locating pin here, just a 60 degree point or a eighth inch pin, so you could drill an eighth inch hole in your part, and that would hold it while you cut the circle of the size that you want. Probably work better with wood than steel, in my opinion, because I think most of us who've cut circles on bandsaws know it's a dance back and forth to get that blade to track, depending on its width, the radius that you want it to. But it may work great, I'm not for sure. But it's, this slides in and out to adjust the size of the circle that you want, and then it's, it's even got a fine adjust on it. So you can move this like you would on a vernier caliper, just to fine adjust the radius. It's even got uh, the swings. So it's definitely neat. You could probably cut a two foot circle with this thing. <laughs> this one doesn't look like it's been used and maybe seeing as old as it is and it not being heavily used, maybe a telling that it's not as useful as it is neat. But there it is circle cutting attachment for a bandsaw. It's definitely well made, no doubt about that. Watch your nose, little girl, it's hot. It's like 28 degrees Fahrenheit outside, or I don't know two degrees Celsius, something like that. Um, got it up to 58 in the shop. So it feels pretty good in here, considering it is pretty cold outside, ain't it, little girl? Yeah, pretty cold. We don't like to be cold, do we? So I went over to KBC Tools and I picked up a few odds and ends for the shop, and I wanna share with you what I got. Recently, I've been using my carbide burrs a lot, and almost every one that I have, they're just dull. So I picked up some new ones. I'll share those with you really quick. Also picked up this very unique set of needle nose pliers. They've got uh, the crimping lug on them. I'll show you those close. Also want to show you this work light. I'm not one to brag on work lights. Normally they're poor quality and poor design, but this thing, uh, as soon as I laid my hands on it, I liked it. So let me show you this thing. I think that you will like it, hopefully as much as I do. So hand tools and stuff, they kind of get me excited. I really love unique stuff like this. Just the other day I was in a situation where I dropped a bolt down an engine bay and that angle for me, I think that would have helped. So pick this up, see so you got the crimping lug. Really nice. Like I said, got these from KBC. There's the bag that it come out of, in case you're interested. Uh, I've also picked up a couple sets of burrs. All of mine got dull. These are MA Fords made in the USA. I picked a small set. I picked up a small set of double cuts. And but all of these are eighth inch shank. And then a larger set of single cut. I was getting pretty frustrated with the ones that I have not cutting. But really out of all of this stuff on the table, surprisingly this work light uh, excites me the most because it does what most work lights don't and that is stays where you put it. I wish you could put your hands on this thing and just just feel how positive everything feels. Most work lights are garbage. I'm just honest at least the ones that I have anyway. They don't stay where you put them. They'll burn you and they're you know just not great. But this one I like. I really like the design. So it's got a row of LEDs. Let me show you. Turn it off. So it's got actually two rows of LEDs. You can rotate the head here, point it where you want. It's got three different power settings. I think it's two, four, and six watt. Elizabeth said she was gonna take this one, so I guess I'm gonna have to get another one. But you can also change the K value of the light. So sitting under the beach or under the sun, you do not wanna sit under the beach. A little cooler, uh, super cold. I like that as well. It's got a 
a nice clamp to clamp to the side of your table, and it's powered from a uh, power block with a uh, USB plug. It's reliable. Uberflex. Yeah, Uberlite Flex 3200TL. I'll put a link in the description for this in case you want to get one for yourself because most work lights, like I said, from my experience are garbage and this thing kind of excited me. So there we go. A couple, a few little items that I added to the shop. Dun, dun, dun. The dramatic moment of this video is here. Are you guys ready for me to pull this cover off and share with you the new piece of shop equipment that I got? Look how big it is. What's under there? Some of you will, after I even pull the tarp off, will be like, what is that? It's a piece of shop equipment that personally I've never ran before, never known anybody that's owned one. Uh, this is the first time that I've ever seen one in person. It's a pretty neat piece of equipment that I think a lot of you guys will find interesting, if nothing else. It, what it does is crucial to the proper function of a, of a machine shop. So, let me get you in a little closer and I'll jerk this thing off of here and you'll be like, oh, that thing is some sort of tool that I've never seen before, probably. Okay, Cora, you grab this end and I'll grab this end and we'll pull it off together as a team. No? Okay. Are you ready? Dun, dun, dun. This is a RO grinder or a relief grinder. I know, I know, exciting. Let me bring you in a little closer. This thing is just jam packed with features. It really is. It's got all kinds of bells and whistles. It's a fully kitted out piece of equipment. I'll show you what it does in just a second. It does a lot of things. I'll show you what it does. I'll show you the kit and stuff that it come with. It's as complete of a machine, at least as far as I can tell, as you could get. So let me get you in closer. I'll explain what this thing does, at least I'll try to. So you didn't want to help me pull it off, but you, uh, now you want to lay on it, huh? Okay. So this machine is a FMF, a Siena Falls Machine Company, and it's called an RO grinder. And what it does is it grinds the relief behind cutting edges on tools that are, they're hard to sharpen any other way other than with a machine like this. This is the way it used to be done, obviously. Now it's done with ones and zeros on a CNC grinder. But before that, it was done on machines like this with cammed, a cam and followers that moved the tool in and away from the grinding wheel in the proper profile that that they should be ground in. This thing can sharpen single flute, um, single flute countersinks, multi flute countersinks, uh, both the Ford type or the Weldon type. You can sharpen these. Um, and I'm just barely scratching the surface on all the functions. You can sharpen drill bits in this thing. Uh, there's a three flute uh, countersink. You could sharpen that on this thing. You can point reamers on this machine. You can sharpen and relieve taps on this machine. It does all sorts of hard to do operations or operations that you just can't do without on a standard um, cutter grinder like that I've got uh, behind this machine uh, simply because it doesn't have the ability to grind axial uh, and radial relief. You can grind straight cutting edges on a with a standard uh, universal cutter grinder, but axial and radial relief, this will do at the same time or individually, uh, depending as best as I've read in this manual, depending on the way that you set this carriage. This thing is a very sophisticated motorized workhead. I mean, it rotates all by a powered control panel. It's got a work light as well. So you can see it's spinning just like any other motorized work head that you got. Let me bring you in a little closer and I'll show you something that it does that is, it's unique to a machine like this and cool if you're the tool dork, I guess. So you can see spinning just like uh, any normal uh, 5C call it fixture, but this has interchangeable cams that you can put right here for single flute up to, I mean, you can make your own cams on this machine. It's so universal. If you have a proper pattern, you could flip this around 
make your own cams. But watch, these are a set of followers. Now I haven't cleaned this machine up good. It's still kind of crunchy, but you see these rollers here? They roll on this cam and the cam sets the profile of the relief on the cutters. So we'll move this in and now when we turn it on, See how it's undulating, I guess you'd say? And you can, it's on a speed controller down here on the control panel. I can speed it up or slow it down. Very, very sophisticated uh, work head. Really nice motor here that's got on the side. Let me get you around. So it's got a bracket here, bracket tree. That's, we've got a really nice cam feature and a toothed belt. Run the whole works. So you can loosen this belt, unlike my other powered work head, you can loosen this belt and tighten it. I mean, super easy. This machine is really well thought out. Um, it's got a spindle lock, really heavy duty spindle lock, so you can just loosen it up, swap parts, um, all sorts of little features. Let me get you a little better shot uh, down here on the, on the bottom part of the carriage, I, I guess you'd say. So you can see this part here, spring-loaded. It's got some rollers and stuff in there. It's all a super precision instrument. Got a V-block here and a tailstock. This is what is considered the tailstock and it bolts here and is adjustable so you can do longer work and support it on the end if your work is centered on both ends. So it's got that. It's also got a very sophisticated, at least in my opinion, it's very sophisticated work head, or not work head, uh, grinder head on this thing. Um, kind of got a brief overview of this. Let me show you the, uh, the grinder head on this. It's pretty neat. So although this looks like something you'd see on a standard bench grinder, it's far from that. This is a precision dual wheeled uh, spindle is what it is. It takes the same hubs as my uh, cutter grinder over there so I can swap wheels from one to the other. This raises and lowers. It also tilts, if you want. It rotates 360 degrees. And it's got a 45,000 RPM high-speed ID grinding spindle attached to it that is controlled down at the control panel It's got a fan in the back and an air filter. It pulls air through the spindle to keep it cool and I guess to keep the chips out of the spindle itself. It sounds like a rocket ship taking off. Seems to be in good shape. In fact, this entire machine seems to be in pretty good shape. It's not probably a machine that got used like making parts constantly day to day to day to day. So it's seems like it's in extremely good shape. The only thing that I've done to this machine personally is I've pulled the wheels off, I've balanced everything, I have wiped it down, but I have yet to disassemble this thing and get some of the crusty grinding grit out of it. If there ever was a bad job when it comes to machine tools, it's cleaning a grinder. They're the worst. Let me show you how quiet this thing is. I mean, it fires right up, and you could you could literally set a stand a penny up on its edge on this thing. It is so smooth. It's crazy. Pretty neat piece of equipment, that's for sure. Got a work light and several other things that are just glossing over. But very, very neat piece of equipment. Let me show you the uh, optical comparator. So let's say you grind a single fluted countersink, just, just an example. And you, before you take it out of the fixture, you want to make sure you got it at the proper angle. Well, you bring in your comparator, and as you move it in, 
actuates a switch there, comes on, you can see I've got, hopefully you can see that, may need to turn out the lights. The point, this is not at the right angle at the moment, it's not set up for this, but you can adjust this, move it in, out, you can move them, you know, and check the angle of your tool, and make sure that you've got it at the proper angle, everything's good. If it's not, you do your adjustments. If it is, right, swing this out of the way. Move on to the next one. It is a pretty neat machine, that is for sure. So this machine is capable of making its own cams. You can make custom cams with this thing. You can also grind gun drills. You can grind helical pointed drills or S-pointed drills, trepanning tools. Um, I don't know, half round drills, high spiral flute taps, you name it. This machine supposedly has the capability to do it. It also came with an array of collets. I don't know if that's a set or not. Some electronics and stuff, some spare electronics are in the base of this. I'm not gonna go through the, through the you know, digging to show you that, but pretty nice little selection of collets that come with this machine, along with a load of cams grinding wheel hubs, the tools to take them on and off, diamond nibs, just parts and pieces that are used with this machine. Spare bulbs for the comparator and um, fuses. It's just like whoever had this thing was using it. It was fully set up. They turned the lights off, closed the drawers, and it was sold. So that is pretty cool. It also come with a diamond grinding wheel and all sorts of stuff. So it was definitely a loaded piece of equipment. So let me show you a few of the basic controls on this machine. I mean, it is pretty interesting. We have grinding head to and fro. We have grinding wheel up and down. We have course feed on the table right and left. That's just for course positioning. And you can lock that. And then you have fine control over here on the end. This machine had a factory option of a DRO on the fine control. This machine doesn't have that. And that's one of the few options that was available for this machine that it doesn't have. So let me show you what I got here. This is an old 5.8 drill, high quality. It's a National, uh, National Detroit high speed steel. 5 eighths of an inch, somebody at some point in this drill's life has ground the end of it to something that they needed that I don't. And I would use this if it had a good point on it. And you know, you're gonna spend some time on the bench grinder refining this thing into the shape that it needs to be. Now keep in mind, I've ran this machine like three times. So I think that we'll get a good usable point on this. And uh, as I go along, I'll really do some serious reading on this machine, but you have to time the cutting edge. It's like 45 degrees it shows in the manual to one of these index lugs, which is locked in there right now. And now I think that I'm ready. I've dressed the wheel, I'm just gonna come in, touch off, lock my gross feed down here, and then use the fine feed to feed it into the wheel. That's all I'm gonna do. So 59 degrees is what we're after. And I believe I'm set up for that. So let's get this thing rocking. Get the spindle on. Bring it in a little closer with the course feed. Lock it. Now we'll use the fine feed to bring it into the wheel slow. we got it. Let me turn off my vacuum system and we'll check this thing out. Uh, come on. 
one switch. There we go. So let's see what we got. Oh man. Looks looks good to me. Now this machine can also come in and we can uh, thin the center or uh, split point this drill. I'm not going to do that at this moment, but it can. Let me show you how good this thing looks and then we'll drill a hole with it. So there we go. Looks really good. Web's getting a little thick on it, but it looks pretty good to me. So let's go. Let's check it. Is that 59? Boom. Checking my angle with the drill point gauge. Looks good to me. Let's go put it in the drill press and punch a hole in some steel with it. Saved its life. So I've got what looks like a piece of three quarter inch. I believe this is just mild steel, just cheese grade stuff. And I am going to pilot drill this because that drill that I just sharpened probably wouldn't do as great as it could unless uh, we uh, thin the web on it. We'll do that later. All I want to see is if it performs good like I would normally use it, which is with a pilot drill on a drill that big. So it's not jumping around, which is really nice. Pulling the chip on both both flutes or teeth. Looks like it's doing pretty good to me. Not pressing very hard, just hard enough to keep it cutting. When a drill is sharpened really nicely on both cutting edges, they don't try to pull themselves through the work or grab and pop and act all silly. You know, uh, new drill cuts. It's usually nice. And that's the way this one feels. And they usually drill to size when they're you know, properly sharp. Call that a success. About as good a finish you know, as you could ask for, I guess, in mild steel. So there it is. Zero damage. Looks pretty good. This thing really does a pretty 
fancy job on these. I need to learn how to split these points really good on this machine. So there we go, a quick look at this machine, really brief, that probably a lot of you have never seen before. I'm sure some of you have, but this is not a very well-known machine. Obviously, there'd be something out there to do the things that this does, but I don't know anybody personally who's ever ran one, and up until I got this one, I'd never even seen one in person. So, you know, being turned loose with this for, I've had about two days to mess with it, and two partial days to mess with it and just gloss my eyes over the manual but that's not enough um, time on something like this to get even partially proficient with it so there's a ton to learn on this and I'm going to be honest I know very little at the moment but I will me and Coral we will put our heads together and we'll learn more about this machine as, as time goes on I do like it I think that it's well kitted and in good shape and It'll be exciting to be able to learn to sharpen some of the more complicated tools in the shop that I couldn't do before. Girl, oh, look at this. Look what I got here. Oh, can I see it? Can I see it? You gotta let go. I can't throw it while you're attached to it. All right, guys. That's it this week. Hopefully I introduced you to either a few small tools that you didn't know existed or maybe that you're interested in building for yourself or a new machine that you, know, you didn't even know it was a thing. Don't feel bad if, if that's you. I'm sure you know there's a lot of people that are perfectly aware of these, but these machines, this RO grinder or axial radial relief grinder, probably would have been far more at home in a custom grinding shop where they made tooling and stuff for other shops than it would have been in your average everyday machine shop. At least in my opinion, a universal tool and cutter grinder was probably as far as a lot of shops went and they would buy their equipment from a grinding shop who most likely had one of these. So I'm interested in trying to learn you know, the ins and outs of this machine and obviously all I did was just barely you know, scratch the surface on what this thing can do. Uh, like I said, I've never ran one, so got a lot to learn. But that's the way it goes, and I kind of enjoy it, to be honest. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who's helped me out whatsoever, it is much appreciated, believe me. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.